Wake Up War Chant, fueled by DeLuna Coffee. Come explore our world of coffee. Established in 2014, DeLuna Coffee is owned and operated by the Lemmix family, Ed, Courtney, and their son, Brett. Ed graduated from FSU in 1979, Brett in 2009. Lifelong fans and Florida State boosters, the Lemmixes attend multiple football games every year where you can find them tailgating near the Unconquered statue. Pull up a chair and pour yourself a Palafox Place. Named after the main hub, Palafox Place in downtown Pensacola, DeLuna has combined a Brazilian, Colombian, and African bean to give it just the right flavor. This coffee can be enjoyed any time of the day. Use the promo code WARCHANT15 for a 15% discount. Visit DeLunaCoffee.com and check out their Facebook and Instagram. From Tally to Cali, it's time to wake up. Wake up, wake up, wake up. Warchant.com is your ultimate seminal sports source. And this is Wake Up Warchant, fueled by DeLuna Coffee. Coffee's for closes only. Now here's Warchant.com's Aslan Hajavandi and Corey Clark. Wake up! What's up, everybody? It is Wake Up Warchant. It is fueled by DeLuna Coffee. DeLunaCoffee.com. Come explore our world of coffee. Go to the website. Scroll just a touch. Warchant Bundle. White Sands Coffee, the Tumbler, Sea Salt Caramels. 40 bucks for all three of those. DeLunaCoffee.com. Use the promo code WARCHANT15. They're Knoll-operated, owned boosters. These folks love Florida State. They love coffee. They're producing fantastic blends just for you, Ed, in his lab. Just a little of this bean. Let me get a Guatemalan bean. Let me get an African bean. Let me get a Colombian bean. Let me, let me see what works. And it all works. It's like a chemist back there. DeLunaCoffee.com. Warchant.com. Ultimate Semmel Sports Source. That's the website that employs Corey Clark and myself. We have a YouTube channel. You might be listening to this on that channel. That's kind of cool. You can just download as a podcast, too. I hope you know. But anyhow, five-star rating and review if you do the podcast thing. If you're on YouTube, hit the thumbs up. Subscribe to the YouTube channel. Corey Clark. You. How are you, man? I'm good, buddy. Hey, thanks for asking. I appreciate that. Every time, man. I feel like you genuinely want to know how I'm doing. I and do. I'm doing pretty well, Aslan. I haven't seen I really him. I, I mean, I saw you Monday morning. Don't know what's happened between now and the press conference. Just want to make sure everything's still kind of on the uh, up and up. Everything's going well. Trending mm-hmm. nicely. Yeah, yeah. I'm still here. Still breathing in air. Uh, uh, still alive. Sun's not out because it's raining right mm-hmm. now. But still, yeah. uh, it's good to be alive. It is. Your nose looks great, by the way. It's it's coming. You, I mean, you're healing quite well. I don't know what kind of genes and genetics old John and – and, and, and gosh, Sharon, dang, I wanted to say I, I was it was I had I'm sorry, Miss Clark. I'm sorry, Sharon. <laughs> but yeah, she'll, healing, she'll get man. over it. Looking great. Uh, yeah, man, it, it uh, looks good. Feels better. Not quite as tight when I raise my eyebrow, my eyebrows. It's uh, starting to starting to look like a real nose again. So uh, I'll be out on the town in no time doing my <laughs> urban, doing my urban impression. <laughs> Just kidding, Steph. Not going to do that. You're not going to see a picture of Corey Clark. Getting uh, you know, whatever Urban's excuse was, getting, what's uh, they what's trying the to get deal? me to dance? Was that was that recent or was that from the past? Like no, the, that was from like uh, I think like Saturday night. Okay, because he had like an Ohio State like quarter yeah, zip on because he like, was you know they played in it. they played in Cincinnati on Thursday, and so he just stayed in Ohio oh, for at least a night or two. Okay, okay, and he was apparently having dinner with his grandkids. That's what he said, and then people kind of tried to talk him into going next door to whatever that bar is. That club is, and then the uh, that stuff ensued. As he, so that was his, his defense. Like, I didn't want to be out, but then my grandkids made me go party. And who's no, gonna, not his grandkids. His grand no, I don't. I don't think so. his grand his grandkids wouldn't be that old, would they? To be I like college so. age? No, no. Um, no, just that he was having dinner next door, um, and people saw him. And it's like, hey, why don't you come over? And then that was his excuse. I, I don't think the grandkids. I hope they weren't in there with him. Um, that's when all that stuff happened. Like somebody else maybe took the grandkids home. I'm sure their parents did. Okay. And uh, Urban was left out on the town. Do what Urban does, but it's it's fine. What are we gonna do? Mm-hmm. Maybe maybe his wife's doing the same thing. I do want to. I do want to take it back. Not because of that. I don't think I could. Not that I. I still root for Florida. I want to see us do well. I don't know how I'd feel if he was our head coach. The winning would be awesome. It really would. But he is so unlikable. There's just not a lot of redeeming things. The winning would be great. I just want to win. I know I said I don't care if you're a jerk. I just want to win. Now there's there's like a, a spectrum of jerkdom. I still don't know if I yes. could go that far. Maybe. 
But then it's again, tough, if you man, promise I, me, man, like a college football playoff appearance within two years and being the Gators, you know, I might be able to kind of tune some of the stuff out. I mean, I think most FSU fans, most, I can't speak for all of them. I can't really speak for any of them. I think they would be like you. Like they would, they would put up with it, but it would feel gross. Yeah. You know, uh, it's, it's probably like voting for someone you don't really like as a person, but mm. they have that little letter by their name that yeah. you identify with. So you vote for them, even if you don't think they're a very good person. I would assume it's the set you kind of just cringely, cringe, cringely. That's, there's no way that's a word. <laughs> You, you put up with it. So you'd put up with the wins knowing ugh, you don't feel great about it. But, you know, the the reality of, of sports, man, is you'd rather win 10 games with a creep and a bad person than go 2-10 and 10 with a good person. That's, that's how sports works. You ain't wrong, man. All right, so Mondays are the weekly press conference where we get Mike Norvell, head football coach of your Florida State Seminoles, Offensive coordinator Kenny Dillingham, defensive coordinator Adam Fuller, and special teams plus defensive ends coach John Papuchas. Papuchas on the hot seat, man. Like 15 minutes of just pure special teams talk. It was, it was interesting. Before we get there, I don't know where I want to start. I should know. I, I kind of drive the show. Let's start defense real quick because I think offense is the – there's more to talk about. Defensively, my guy, you know, Adam Fuller. We don't know each other from Adam. But – he pretty much said without saying, I don't know what you want me to do with this with this secondary I have. Like, do you see who my secondary is? And then people are like, well, it's, it's the coaching. It's not the players. And I get it, man. There's a lot of – I mean, Jarian Jones was one of the top players in the state of Mississippi. He was a four-star. Uh, Travis Jay was four-star, although he's kind of dealing with some injuries. Renato Green was a four-star, but I don't, he's, he wasn't even, he didn't even play. Um, Neither did Akeem Dent. Right, right. There's a, he was a five star, uh, I think, on our our network. So, you know, and Ira kind of asked him, you know, with all these combinations, like, is that a cool thing? And he's like, well, not really. He's like, that's not part of the plan. I mean, he basically, without throwing the guys under the bus, he gave a nuance. He gave nuanced answers. Basically, he likes the way they're playing against the run. He likes the way the front four is playing. And I don't even know if the linebackers are as big uh, crazy enough. I mean, am I being crazy here, Corey? I don't even know if the linebackers are as big of a liability as a secondary right now. And who'd have thunk that? He just he is not a big fan of his secondary. Um, and I don't know. I mean, they, they can't cover well. They can't communicate all that well either. So what can you do when, you, or when you're kind of in this situation is, is sort of the vibe I got from him. I don't know what you got. Uh, yeah, he wasn't in the best of moods. But, you know, he did get that dub. I, I, you know, I did think that uh, only his fourth is a Seminole. So I hope he enjoyed it. I hope he had a good Saturday night anyway. Um I don't think it's necessarily my player. That's the thing. I, I don't think you could look at Florida State secondary and go, well, they're just that's just trash. There's nothing there. That's not the issue. They're not, you know, the in the weight game, yeah, Jarian Jones just lets a dude run right by him. But the bigger problem you have is why do guys keep getting so wide open? Those aren't physical limitations. It's communication limitations, which goes back to coaching limitations, I guess. I don't know. But he said, you know, Kevin Knowles had come out of the game and come back into the game. Jamie Robinson was playing safety, like true safety, for the first time. And on one of those plays, Kevin Knowles passed him off, I guess, I think, that uh, in coverage on a crossing route, thinking that Jamie Robinson was going to be there. Jamie Robinson was not there, and it ends up being a huge play, and they do that a lot. So that's, to me, that's the issue. I, it might be, yeah, I don't have uh, Dion and Ramsey and Derwin back there. We, we all understand that. But they can be better coached where you don't just give up huge, not even huge plays, because every secondary gives up big plays, except Georgia's. Every secondary in football gives up big plays. They're so easy. Like, it'd be one thing if they just, like the Notre Dame, we didn't have a huge problem with those Notre Dame passes, right? Other than the first good touchdown. Position. First touchdown was ugly, but then the rest of them were contested. And yes, they were Yeah, the 30-yard, 40-yard passes where you're right there. I mean, you can't fault the coach for that. They're, you're right there. What are you going to do? Yeah. These you can, I think, fault the coach for a little bit because they're so easy. They're such pitch and catch throws. That kid is not a good quarterback. He is a unique athlete, but he is not a good quarterback. And you let him get into a little bit of rhythm um, where he was just having pit th easy throws to make in the middle of the field with nobody there. And that, to me, is is the issue with the secondary more than just how, how good or not they are physically. Um, that said, it doesn't help. 
I think what Ira was trying to ask is like you, you they've rotated in so many guys like Cindy Williams in there, Brennan Gantz in there, Jamie Robinson's playing safety, Dent can't play, Renardo Green can't play. Like all these guys that maybe you thought were going to be playing um, aren't, and the communication issues are showing up. But then they showed up again. La- they showed up last year too. Um, so they haven't had a lot of. Uh, it's like the offensive line; they haven't had a lot of continuity. But still, in the secondary specifically, you don't have to look that bad even if you don't have continuity. The guys should know what they're doing. Syracuse wasn't running 25 trick plays. In fact, it seemed like they just kept running the same play over and over. And it was, a, it was still a problem to, to defend it for a, at least some of that game. The way he answered these questions, though, and I don't want to give him too much benefit of the doubt. Again, this isn't a pro Adam Fuller podcast. I assume he's not going to be here next season. He might not be the only one. Um, but just I can't imagine him teaching so terribly that this is constantly happening. But I guess maybe that's easier to explain. He must be teaching it wrong. That's why these guys keep screwing it up rather than these guys are not – they don't know how to communicate and hand guys off to each other. They're getting confused, and that's them not being able to retain the stuff in the classroom, which sounds unfair to them, and we're not allowed to do that. We're not allowed to, to – poke at the players so we have to kind of no you can't fire the whole secondary though right yeah you know you can't fire the whole defense you can fire the guy that um and i'm not advocating for that right now at all um again i like the guy as a as a human being um but you're allowed to say okay we're not saying that adam fuller is telling those guys to not be in that spot but when it keeps happening two or three times a game where you just give up these huge busts and no matter what who what players are on the field at some point, it's like okay, whatever you're, however you're trying to communicate your vision, right? And when the picture changes, he says that a lot. When the picture changes, yeah. this is what you have to you have to focus on, or this is what the keys are. And they still don't get it. Fourteen games in, it's still happening. It's going to happen a whole bunch this weekend, probably. That to me is is the issue is that it just doesn't seem to be getting uh, taught very well or retained very well. But if it's not getting retained very well, that's still on you. You know, you've got to figure out a way to make them understand it. Yeah. And so, you know, that's that's hopefully that will start happening. I just feel like it's so difficult to defend in this day and age. And then you're trying to have a check and a, re- a response to any kind of look you're getting. And um, so you, you can't simplify. Like, remember, we would get on, you know, Harlan about him trying to simplify things and make it easier. And it's like, well, that that's not working either. I, I don't know if you can be like, well, listen, man, there's just – we're going to go and cover three. You cover this third of the field. That's your. You got the middle half, and you've got the uh, the boundary core uh, third or whatever of the field. Um, because like, offense will find ways to exploit that. Like you can't you can't dummy down defense as much as you used to be able to do back in the day. I don't think. So I don't really know like what else is left for him to do. Because I'm sure he's tried every kind of different way to of getting to these guys. Um, but like we like Jamie Robinson's athleticism. Uh, I like Mako Dotson. Jarian Jones should be serviceable in the ACC, but we're just seeing all these kind of flaws. Well, to me, the frustrating thing is I was almost going to ask him this, but I, it really wasn't going to be a question. It was almost just going to put him in a more salty mood. But just if you tell any defensive coordinator you can stop the run by and large and you can pressure the quarterback with just four, like anybody would take that. Like those are those are the absolute building blocks for a successful defense. Stop the run, pressure the quarterback with only having to bring four people. And I think they can do that mostly. I mean, a lot of their pressure is just generated from Robert Cooper and Fabian Lovett breaking the pocket and and Jermaine Johnson coming off the edge or Kier Thomas coming off the edge. And their teams really aren't being all that successful running the ball against them outside of a couple of these crazy runs that kid had. Like, How come they cannot make the secondary work? And that's just terribly confusing and frustrating again as they've now had 14 games together a full off season like a full legit off season they had they had zoom nothing but zoom classroom stuff that you think maybe that would have done something good last year then they had full hands on full go camp this year none of it is is clicking so i i just don't even know what's left to really say about them but just wanted to talk about that cuz that's what caught my ear Corey. that's what caught my ear well, and I did again. I don't. I don't think they were terrible. I think they've gotten better um, from last year. Um, I was just trying to look up the my man Frimrow's efficiency ratings, and I couldn't do it. Um, but so I was. I was interested in what you were saying, so I was only half trying. Appreciate that. Um, but you know, going into last week, they were sixty 
whatever seventh in the country in defense defensive efficiency last year they were 103 um i can't imagine that number went uh down with that game on saturday uh on saturday because i thought for a lot of the a lot of the game they played well it's just there's still some of that you know you give up a long run and then all of a sudden the wheels fall off for about 12 minutes where you just can't get out of your own way you rally back up get some stops look like you're kind of tra- taking control of the game then you'd fumble a punt and things go awry but at the end they made plays when they had to make them they did well on third down i don't i thought they they handled the traditional run game well but fuller kept bringing back up now fuller wasn't beating his chest and and you know bathing himself in love at the press conference but he was talking about how so many of their yards i think it was 130 of their yards Syracuse's yards came just on uh, uh, naked bootlegs. I want to say naked. I'm trying not to. In fact, when I asked the question, I, I think I said naked. Um, I'm trying to get that out of my vocabulary. Brady gives me a hard time. So naked. But they gave up like 130 yards just on nakeds. Man, that sounds weird to say. How do y'all not say naked? Seriously. Um, weirdo. Uh, and, uh, so, you know, I think he was trying. You know, they, they have been better just against the run. Just a traditional running game. That kid... Uh, didn't have a great game. The running back didn't, but that they they knew that big guy was a, a threat to a quarterback, and there were two or three times where they just let him get loose for uh, almost inexplicably. Um, and I think Papuchas even said it when we were talking about that. How it just comes out of nowhere, like you're playing awesome, and they were. They played the first quarter awesome. They the first four drives were great, and then all of a sudden he hits one run, and then you're hanging on for dear life. Uh, for the for the rest of the half, then you get rallied back. You seem to play better in the third quarter, but then you give up some stuff late in the third quarter that that gives them the lead or gets them tied. So that's that that's what's so bizarre about that defense is they don't they they've shown much more flashes of competence in actually being a decent defense this year than last year. Like last year, it was all bad. Um, this year, they've had more stretches of being good. They had twelve straight stops. From the start of the Louisville game or the end of the Louisville game to the to the Syracuse game, twelve straight stops. But then when it goes bad, it's tough. It seems like it's tough to get them back going. But you're right. I do think defense is hard. I think what Georgia is doing is an anomaly. You can't compare yourself to that because that I just don't understand how that's happening. I I truly don't. That's incredible what they do. Um, they also haven't played a bunch of great offenses, but still, that's nuts. Um, but yeah, Florida State, if they could get, if they could take another step, right, maybe by the end of the year and get from mediocre, which I think right now, wouldn't you say they're a mediocre defense? Yeah, that's accurate. I'll go with that. Last year, they were horrible. Yes. So the next step is to be good, or at least a little bit better than average. They can start winning some games around here, man. Like they're, they're, they're not too far off defensively if they can get stuff on the back end squared away. That's what I'm talking about. Like, you just let them, you, you give up so many easy yards. Like, you know, it's not like guys are having to make great plays. It was a pretty impressive run by the guy, the 55 yard run, but it was also, it was, you know, it was 20 yards before anybody was near him. And once he got going, it was like watching Derrick Henry. But, um, but the other plays are what's so frustrating is they're so easy. You make it so easy on them. Uh, to to go down the field it, it, just to hit big plays in the middle of the field. You'd hope that gets taken care of at some point in our lifetimes. You want to beat up on pro football focus? Look at some of this nonsense. All right, so 60 is the baseline. So you pretty much start off at a 60, and then you either get points added or deducted based on how you are. Man, that 17 defense graded out at 93, 91 in coverage. Harlan Barnett's first year, they were in 90 defensively, 73 coverage. 19. That can't be right. That I'm, can't be right. Are you I'm, looking at the wrong? I'm, I'm looking at Florida State. I'm looking at Florida State. All no, that... the 17 defense wasn't Harlan Barnett. I know, but saying did... Charles Kelly, 17, 93 was the defense. 92, okay. 91 was coverage. Harlan Barnett's first season, 2018, they were a 90 defensively. 73 oh. in coverage. Big plummet. I mean, they plummeted from 91 to 73 on the grade scale, on the grade scale. I don't know how that ranks nationally. Pro Football Focus doesn't do a real good job of being allowing you to sort uh, nationally ranking-wise. Sorry, guys, not you know trying to be a jerk, but you, just, you don't do a good job of it. Last season with Willie and Harlan, they were 83 defensively, 70 
coverage. Last season, Adam Fuller, first year, 66. 66 overall as a defense, 74 coverage. I mean, just huge fall from grace defensively overall. This year, they're an 80, which is not as good as Barnett ever had them and is not as good as what Charles Kelly's last season was. But the coverage is the worst that it's been over that five-year stretch. They're at 64. And that's the thing. They just mm. they do not cover well at all. And, I, again, I know we can call it defense, but man, I just, they don't have guys that can stay on guys' hips. Uh, they just don't have guys that can run in stride with people. In this conference, too, which is really the scary thing. I mean, there's they haven't gone up against anybody that's elite, I don't think. I mean, those Notre Dame receivers are good. A.T. Perry from Wake Forest is good. None of those guys are first-round picks. None of those guys are second-day NFL draft picks. And I hate to use that as the, the barometer of what's good and what's great, but it's just it's, it's maddening. It's frustrating. Let's move over to offense then, Corey, shall we? Mm, let's do it. You wrote, I don't know if what came first. I don't know if it was the chicken or the egg with you. I don't know if the text message came first or if it was your story came first, but you, you did a, a deep dive into the offense of Mike Norvell here at Florida State and the way it produces when Jordan Travis is at the controls versus the way it performs when anybody else, so that would be what, James Blackman, Chubba Purdy, uh, Tate Rodemaker, Mackenzie Milton, and there were some pretty eye-opening numbers there. Was it? Uh, did you go into Sunday evening thinking you were going to write something, or did you just research it and be like, well, shoot, i got to write about this now? Well, I researched it thinking, okay, if the numbers say what I think they might say, I'll probably write on this. But even the numbers were more dramatic uh, than I thought. Um, uh, I don't have them right in front of me. Let them. Let, you don't have that story open, do you? Why would I do that? Why would I be prepared, Corey? Let me. I can get it. I can get it. I mean, they're my numbers. I should have had them ready. I didn't know we were going to talk about it. Though we should. We should talk about the things on the site. Um, but basically, the the my theory was going into it was. Florida State's offense is much better Better when Jordan Travis has the football at quarterback. I mean, I think we all understand that. We all know that. But I don't think you understood how much better it was. And so I went and did a deep dive. I literally went through every drive that the offense has had, not counting kneel downs, that the offense has had since Mike Norvell has been the, the head coach of Florida State. They've had 173 offensive drives. Um, Jordan Travis has been a part of 94 of them. He's been, he's been the quarterback for 94 drives out of 173. In those 94 drives, the Florida State offense has scored 35 touchdowns and kicked seven field goals. Um, so they score a touchdown about 37% of the time when Jordan Travis is the quarterback, has been the quarterback for the series. Um, I don't know where that ranks nationally. I would think that's not a terrible percentage. No, no, no. You know, 37.2 is not terrible. It's not Jameis Winston. It's not probably even ponder, but 37.2 isn't bad. When the other guys have the ball, so they so the other have been 79 other drives have been by other quarterbacks from Blackman last year, Chuba, Tate last year, and then McKenzie Milton this year. The other 79 drives, they have scored a touchdown 13.9% of the time. And that's not a small sample size. You're talking about 94 drives for Travis, 37.2%. 74 drive, 74 drive, 79 drives for the other guys, 13.9%. I know that's a lot of numbers. But basically, Florida State has almost a three times better chance of scoring a touchdown when Jordan Travis is the quarterback as to when anybody else is the quarterback. This year with Milton, the difference is a little smaller, but not much smaller. I think Milton scored six touchdowns out of 32 drives. Travis is 10 out of 31. And one of Milton's six was the drive that Travis got him out to midfield before he got hurt against Notre Dame. So the point being, the point of the whole thing was like, number one, how bad? And also, he's four and three. In games where he's played a majority of the game, like more than a half, Florida State is four and three the last two years with Jordan Travis. 0 and seven with everyone when he doesn't. No matter who's quarterback in there, 0 and seven. Um, so, you know, they're averaging like 34 points. They're averaging 34 points a game when he gets a majority of the reps. They're averaging 16 points a game when he doesn't. The numbers are incredible. Like, I knew there were going to be a difference. I didn't know they were that stark. Um, so the point, of the, the point of the column was like, look, when Jordan Travis is healthy, he's got to be your quarterback. It does not mean he's Dan Marino. It does not mean he's the best player in the country. He's the only one right now with the limitations of this offense. He's the only one for whatever reason 
that can move this offense and put points on the board. And even that last game Saturday, it wasn't it wasn't a, an aesthetic of beauty, was it? Nobody was like, wow, this offense is humming. I think a lot of us were like, man, this offense is kind of trash. They just don't do anything well. Oh, wait, they got 33 points. They got 33 points, as if that happens all the time at Florida State these days to score 30 points in a conference game. Travis has started two games this year and played a majority of the games. They've scored 38 and 33 in those two games against the two best defenses they've seen this year. And in the rest of the games, they're averaging 15, 16 this year. So what do you do with that, man? Do I, I, don't, I don't even know how to explain it. Can you? Because it's not like you watch it and go, man, this is a well-oiled machine when he's in there. It still sputters around and hiccups and lot, some three and outs and some gross overthrows and some missed opportunities on third and two and some turnovers. But at the end of the day, he put up 28 of the 38 against Notre Dame. Notre Dame has not given up more than 26, I don't think, since then. And he put up the most points anybody's put up on Syracuse, too. How? You got an explanation? No, that's uh, what's so frust- not frustrating, but it's just so difficult to discuss his play. Because, God, I mean, after all that, how can you say to not start him? Not, I, I should have. And I, I wanted to ask Kenny, but I, I thought it had been un- unfair to ask Kenny without asking Norvell about it. Because Kenny, Kenny like, speaks with more praise, like, when he's when when Jordan Travis comes up, like Norvell's pretty even keeled, but I thought Kenny was a little bit more forthright when he was asked about Jordan on Monday when Ira asked him about like you know what's it like when he's you know he's hearing every like the, the, the Mackenzie Milton story is a great thing, but obviously how does that kind of affect Jordan and you know Kenny's like hey man like you know when you know that a hundred thousand people are like we'd rather have the other guy that's going to affect you, so it's like all right well. Are you but are you guys letting it affect you? I mean, my question was like you you guys talk about how he gives you so much of a of like an added boost. Well, like why wasn't he? Why didn't he go into the Jacksonville State game? I mean, he went in the game. He had a drive to himself, and then in Louisville and he played tailback. Yeah. Well, yeah. but they then he had a drive too. He went three. And no, out. I'm saying, and then the other only other time he was in the right. game was was as a tailback. Yeah. Correct. Correct. Well, not really. I mean, Mackenzie Milton was almost as much of a tailback as he was. That was the problem, Oh, well, right? true. Good point. That's right. Um, Louisville, again, that's a one-possession game. You don't utilize him. He got two touchdowns against Wake Forest. So, I, I, and, and like, I'm like, I don't want to give away your guys' mysticism with announcing who your starting quarterback is going to be. But, man, should we assume then when he is not on the field it's because he is hurt? Otherwise, what? again, like all these stats you just rattle off, it doesn't make sense then to not play him. So what what gives? Yeah, I I think that's it. The 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 one the one and that's what I said in the column. Like, I, you know, he can't stay on the field. So this point was the point of the column wasn't necessarily why haven't you guys played him for all fourteen games? He wasn't available. He couldn't play against NC State last year. He got knocked out at the first half against Pitt last year. Um, Louisville is the only real game that he played a majority of the game and didn't play well. Um, but, uh, but other than that, he still played better than Chubba when Chubba came in. But all these other times, he's just been banged up. Except, in my opinion, the Jacksonville State game. Like, we, he had a cramp against Notre Dame is what they said. He got a body cramp after his helmet came off. And that's why Milton went in the game and stayed in the game. Well, he, sh- he must have been healthy enough because they put him at they put him at running back and let him run the ball. Right. So he wasn't unhealthy for the Jacksonville State game. And that's the one miscalculation I think this coaching staff made. I think they did it because of how McKenzie Milton looked in the final part of that game. Maybe because game day was doing a story on him. I don't know. I don't understand. That's the one misstep I think they've done with the quarterbacks. Other than that, I think it's all been predicated on health. Like, I think he didn't start the Wake Forest game, but he came in in the second series. Um, and then played a majority of that half. So why they did that, I don't know. But I think when he's healthy, they know he gives them the best chance to win. Now they do. The Jacksonville State game, they didn't. I think they they got caught up in the McKenzie magic, man. They're like, wow, if we don't have that bad snap, McKenzie Milton looked incredible. We just got to ride this. But look, man, the second half of that Jacksonville State game, McKenzie Milton put up a whopping three points, and it was on a 53-yard field goal. That's all they did. Last year against Jacksonville State, Jordan Travis scored touchdowns on five straight drives. 
out of nowhere. Like that, he would have won that game for you. He would have put up, because it's what he does, he would have put up, I can promise you to put up more than three points in the second half of that game. And that's all you would have needed. So I, and they went with him. They just were like, McKenzie's our guy. But I think now they understand. I, I'm sure they have those numbers anyway. Um, I feel like Dillingham was kind of touting him after the Notre Dame game when he felt some pressure from the fans to play Milton. He kept talking about how they're so much better with Jordan Travis at quarterback or have been since they've been there. But those are such stark numbers. Yeah. I mean, you're talking about 18 points, 18 more points a game with one guy at the quarterback spot than the other. And again, when you look at the games themselves and watch them, you're like, this is kind of ugly. This is hard to watch. This isn't all that fun. Oh, wait, they got 38. Oh, now they got 33. Well, last week, last year against Notre Dame, which was a very good team, got 26 and also had the ball at the two, going in for another score. North Carolina, 31. You know what I mean? Like, it, it, it he... He has an ability somehow to to make plays and get them in the end zone more than the other guys do. I don't I don't even know if he's the answer for next year. And how can you count on him because he's always hurt? And I think it seems like it seems like to me. And tell me if you agree with this. The way that as a oh, way that Aslan, I, you and Norvell are close. I don't know why. I think of you in the same uh, the, the same, same way. tax bracket. You know. Sure. Right. Um, well, yeah. With all this YouTube money. Mm. When um when when Norvell was talking about Travis after the game and then today and was brought up what he played through, yes. Does it seem like maybe they're they they've had to f- figure out a way to relay to him, man? If you can play, you have to play. Like we need you out there. Whatever we got to do to to get you feeling healthy enough to move around, we can't have you every time. There's a you you. you you're tweaked, you don't feel 100% to just sit out the game. We can't have you do that. Look, you look what our offense is. Because he kept talking about how proud he was of him, of fighting through it, of pushing through it. He said pushing through after the game, and he said pushing through on Monday, meaning that to me maybe, maybe he wasn't great at pushing through last year. Does that make sense? Yeah, I do wonder how much of last year, just all that chaos with like COVID and everything and just them not wanting to push guys – you know, not that it's a COVID related issue, but just last year was just so weird. I don't know if you, and it's your first season. I don't know if you want to redline guys without being able to kind of establish the trust and, and, and whatnot. But yeah, I mean, uh, you know, when I asked him about it last week at, at practice, you know, I, I thought that he actually was kind of faking it. The, the answer he gave about, like, oh, yeah, like Jordan really toughed it out and uh, showed us something by being at practice today and giving us what we need. I was like, ah, it's just him just kind of you know, trying to go along with the question I asked. But, yeah, that's that's twice. I mean, he, he mentioned it then, and I guess it was sincere, and then after the game and then again on Monday. Um, so, I don't know, maybe, yeah, maybe it's one of those things where it's like, hey, you have to learn. We've told you to, to get down and, and get out of the way as much as you can. Now the next part of this progression is, like, you're just going to have to learn to play just hurt, you know. Like, there's a difference between being hurt and injured. Like, if you're right. not injured, like, just try to try to give us something. Uh, because to all those numbers you point out, man, are just – they're huge. They're huge differences. But, again, at the same time, though, we didn't see any of that elusiveness and that breakaway speed prior to the Syracuse game. Not, I mean, he had, the, he had the one run when he got the helmet knocked off, but that still wasn't even as dynamic as or explosive as he was last season. Like the stuff that we saw last season, the Houdini stuff running around – dodging six guys trying to sack him and then ending up with a 35-yard run. We didn't see any of that this season until the Syracuse game. But then maybe it's not fair because, to your point, he hasn't really been put in the game a lot. So here we are. Well, and what's crazy about that, too, is, right, I think he had nine rushing yards against Notre Dame. and So before his last run of 25, he was like negative 16. They still had 28 on the board and were driving again. And it's, it's, you know, Dillingham talked about, I thought, watch watch his press conferences, watch them all. But he actually talks about why they had those running backs out wide, what they were trying to do. And then he, he said it multiple times, like, look, we have those running backs out wide. Um, it can put you in zero coverage, but it, it'll put you in man because they ha- we know they're going to be in man because they have to have somebody in the middle of the field to account for Jordan. Basically saying they get defended differently when Travis is a quarterback, even if they're running the same plays. Now they ran it; they did a lot of those, all those swing passes. Were it set some stuff up, but it was mainly they knew they couldn't block them, they couldn't pass protect. So they just want to get at the ball out of Jordan Travis's hands quickly. Hopefully, they can get some blocks downfield, 
and and hit a six or seven yard. They wanted that was basically their running game, is what he said. That was an extension. That's why they had running backs on each side of the field. Just get them out wide. Hopefully, get some blocks and yada yada. But he's like the the reason that should work is because with Jordan Travis in a, in the game, you can't just go play four guys over there with with the four receivers. Because if you do that and you have a you have a you have another guy out there with the other receiver and a safety up top, Jordan Travis can run for twenty yards a play like that. You have to account for him as a runner, and that changes the way you defend things. And again, I, I it's it's not like I'm arguing that this guy is incredible. I think those numbers are incredible. I, it just it doesn't make sense because when you watch it, like the Notre Dame game, I didn't think he played well, right? He didn't. No, not He put up more points on them than anybody else has, including the number five team in the country. And he was going in for, I mean, Florida State scored 38 against Notre Dame. Nobody else has gotten over 26. And one of those, I think, the, whoever scored 26, Toledo or somebody, one of them was a pick six. Like, Notre Dame has a really good defense. Still, their offense is awful. Crazy that Jack Cohn looks like Jack Cohn again. Um, they, man, he was, he was Joe Montana that night. But their, their defense is legit. Like, it's one of the better ones in the country. Jordan Travis, hook or crook, by hook or crook, however he's doing it, he put up 38 on them, put up 30 on them last year almost, and put up uh, 33 on a pretty good Syracuse defense. I don't know how. You explain it to me, Aslan. I can't. We can't. We don't know how. But I, I think his presence back there makes makes Florida State tougher to defend. Clearly. That's that has to be it. They they just they're tougher to defend with Jordan Travis back there. Not because he's running like uh you know Lamar Jackson this year, although he had a nice game, light was certainly nice drive there at the end, but because there's the threat that he can do it. And just having the threat back there is something this offense has to have because it doesn't have a whole lot of a whole lot else. Like it's a, it's 17 points is awful in college football. That's an awful score to finish with, especially in not a great conference. That's what they average with anybody but Jordan Travis doing it. When Jordan Travis is playing, they average 34 and a, 34 and a half points per game, which is pretty darn good. Probably top 50, top 40 in the country. That's so stark, it's incredible. But can he get through a whole game? Can he get through a whole season? Can you count on him next year? No, you can't. That's the issue. If he was one of these Iron Men that just took hits and kept getting up, well, man, I think they're probably, uh, man, I think they're probably three and two right now. That's not true. They're, well, yeah, I do. I, I think they beat Louisville if Jordan Travis is the quarterback, and I and I definitely know they beat Jacksonville State. So they're three and two. It's that that's how big a difference he is. But again, I don't blame the coaches for anything but the the Jacksonville State game, and I blame them for everything about that game. They should be two and three. They blew that on defense. They blew it on offense by not playing the quarterback that gives them the best chance to win. For a reason we still don't quite understand, but because he was healthy then. But I think moving forward, if he's if he can go, he's got to be your guy. Winning season rolling over at MyBookie, and this week entries now open for the winner take all super contest. MyBookie, the only sports book that offers online super contests, so you can't miss out on their exclusive promotion. Use the promo code WARCHANT and get your first deposit. MyBookie doubled with your deposit, and you can turn $10 into $10,000. Weeks five through eight of the NFL season, make five picks against the spread, get them right, earn points, go up the standing boards, take home the $10,000 grand prize promo code war chance so you can double your funds to double your winning bet anything anytime anywhere with my bookie they are now installed on my bookie and also most major sports books Corey, 17 point underdog against north carolina thoughts well that's, it could hurt your feelings a little bit but it makes sense right like they haven't won they haven't won a road game since Norvell took over. They haven't even been close in a road game since Norvell took over. And last year, they weren't even real road games. You're playing in front of 100 people. Um, so, yes, I would. I think that's a good, fair number. Until Florida State, it can, can prove it can not only win games, but at least keep them relatively close. Um, I understand that number. And you know Carolina's going to put up some points. That kid is really good. He's got a good receiver. Um, they, they have a good scheme. They're going to put up points, especially at home. They play much better at home. So 17 is fair, right? You could see like a uh, a 38-21 type of game, I think. 
Well, I think 17 just makes sense for them to if you're if you're thinking that you know, listen, they have a really good offense. Florida State's not good. 17 is the number that would make you you know get even sort of action, which is which as Ira tells us is is the main function of these sports books. MyBookie.ag use the promo code WarChant. Yeah, I mean, just the last thing on the Jordan Travis and Corey, I don't, it's just, it, I guess it's a, the whole Javi Baez thing, you know, just strike out, strike out, home run. And even when he doesn't house it, and he, he hasn't done a house call this year. I mean, he did last year against North Carolina, and I think Pitt. Um, it, I guess it's just him being able to get you on the plus side of the field, and then this offense just finds ways to, to be okay when they can make it on the other side of the 50. Because they they run the ball well, though. I mean, between the tackles, they ran the ball I was exceptional, but they ran the ball quite well against a, a stingy Syracuse defense. But um, maybe it's just that. Maybe it's just that, you know, with the way this defense is playing and the amount of possessions you get, you give him eight possessions, you know, he can strike out, strike up, and he's going to hit a home run. So he's going to get you a touchdown, and, 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 you know, every third drive, that's not bad. It's not a bad ratio. But just it'd be cool if you just wouldn't run into sacks. But we can't ask for everything, Corey. We can't ask for Well, everything. I don't even think it's that as much as, uh, like we were texting last night, I wonder how many times they have schemed up something open quickly. Guy comes open free, and he doesn't necessarily see it um, as quickly as he needs to. Uh, you know, there, there, there are certain some limit, limitations. As, as, as Kenny pointed out in the press conference on Monday, he's played like six full games as a quarterback. So he's still growing in that instance. He said, I think he said he had four missed assignments. Travis did, four and a half. Like one of them was... You know, maybe not staying in the pocket when he actually had one. There's some of those things that you're you're still dealing with, and you're going to deal with. Um, the throw, the deep throws he made were not on time or good. Um, one is just an easy touchdown to Parchment if he just lays it out there, um, and he doesn't. He puts way too much mustard on it. He doesn't. Sometimes it feels like he throws the ball too hard. Little things that guys that have played the position a long time know. Like on a slant, you don't have you can't throw it 100 miles an hour. They're not going to catch that. Um, you don't have to throw it like the Keyshawn Helton play. That thing's wide open, man. You don't have to. You don't have to gun it at him. Um, you you can take a little something off and make it more of a catchable ball. That that's the biggest issue I have with him as a quarterback right now is a lot of his balls. Even even if they're caught, they're thrown. It's not much, but they're thrown a foot too low, a foot too behind, which which can kill the whole play. When the guy has to turn to stop to get the ball on a swing pass. Or to, or to kind of almost turn around to catch it, that can stop the whole play. Uh, but he does more good than bad, especially compared to everybody else that's taken snaps uh, for this. I mean, that's crazy. They've had five starting quarterbacks in 14 games. Think about that. Uh, that's crazy. Five and 14 games? There's nobody that's had that many. And four of them have been awful. Four of them have been done nothing. Like the most points they've scored in a game where Jordan Travis didn't play is the 22 against NC State last year in a game they were down 28-3. to Like, that's the best quarterback game they've had without, without Jordan Travis being involved. So, mainly I just, and I'll probably be on this train the whole year, maybe the next three years, for all I know, the way this is going. Um, I hope he's appreciated for as bad as this offense can look sometimes, how much worse it would be if he wasn't around, if he had stayed at Louisville or had left when they got Milton. Like, what would you be looking at now? You'd be looking at 0-5 for sure, um, and you'd have an offense that's averaging 17 points per game. So, uh, you know, I, I I hope that he's at least appreciated. Like, people – because people think he's terrible. I see it all the time on our message boards, on Twitter. I'll get an email about it. Like, yeah, they got to get a real quarterback. They got to get somebody that can make plays. All right, man. Like, sure. But, you know, they, they average 34 points a game when he's the quarterback. How much more real do you want him to look? Do you want him to average 50? Like, there's only so much you can do with a bad offensive line and receivers that don't make plays. But he's doing he's doing all he's it seems like he's doing about as well as you can, considering what he's what he's got to work with. Um, so hopefully people that column, if nothing else, will have people appreciate what he's done these last 14 games, how, how important he's been to Norvell, how important he's been to the offense and how bad it how bad it all is without him. It ain't great with him. We got it. Understood but how bad it would be without him. Well said. All right, uh, special teams, last thing. Yeah. I mean, that was like four. I like that. That was that Usually was... Papuchas comes in, and it's just him and Ira, because uh, Ira, Ira is going to ask questions. That's just what he does. 
But uh, Ira will ask like four in a row, and that'll be a wrap. <laughs> like, all right, cool. Maybe somebody else will ask about the defensive ends. And it will be in and out in, what, two and a half minutes? Yeah, like four, four and a half. Not this time, my man. Not 14. when the special teams looks like that. You're going to get some. I even asked him a question. I haven't asked Papuchas a question, I don't know, in a year. But I, I even had to ask him a couple questions because it was uh, what, what we saw on Saturday was so abysmal. What we've really seen all season. But, yeah, I thought that was funny that he's like, oh, I see how it is. When well, we're not doing anything wrong, I get two questions a week, and they're both from uh, Ira. But, whoa, and when, when things go wrong, oh, everybody, that doesn't, people that don't even know my name are asking me questions now. I see how it is. You know, Mike Norvell even said it about the amount of time they invest in practice and they're not getting out of it what they, they need to. So that this is something that's obviously going to be under uh, evaluation. And then Papuch has got a couple more of the more technical, I guess, questions asked to him about it. But uh, nothing was right Saturday against Syracuse. And everything that we saw was not the way, at least what we've been told from them, that's not the way they're coached to do it. Uh, some of the stuff was a little sort of tricky, I guess he talked about. I guess they hit a certain point in that game where, like, hey, if it's in the end zone, we're just going to take it at the 25-yard line. And Ja'Kai fielded it like a half yard inside the end zone. And Papucha said he you know, might be one of those things where he didn't realize where he was on the field, which like, I appreciate your honesty. But let's not have guys back there that don't don't have a feel for field position or where they're at in an end zone. Like, we don't need Dan Orlovsky running out the back of the end zone and getting a safety. It just goes back to the fact that, and I don't know how you can, I don't know how many guys you recruit. Like, there's not a lot of Greg Reeds out there. Like, listen, Greg Reed was a cornerback first and foremost, but he also could return punts just as capable as he could cover a, def, a, a wide receiver. They don't have any of those guys. There's no naturally gifted vision, burst, urgency. Like, they have none of that. And that goes to the point of Pokey being in the position of re- trying to return a punt. Like, we have guys that are explosive, they said, so we're just trying to get them out there. And I was like, you don't. Like, how, I mean, I know you can't come up here and say we don't have those guys, but you don't have to come up and, and lie, for lack of a better term. Like, if Pokey's explosive, if, if Pokey's considered an explosive guy, man, you got to go to the drawing board and I don't know, I guess maybe that's where Travis Hunter comes in. You just hope he's going to do everything for you. There's got to be somebody out there. I know Corey Wren's banged up, and he was probably the, the solution they were hoping for, but he never looked all that good in practice returning kicks. That's maybe even more so than Adam Fuller not having capable cornerbacks that can cover guys. But they don't have guys that, that can see a field like, you know, 60 yards downfield and then sideline to sideline well because they're they're – kick returns are almost as bad as Alonzo Hampton's and that's got to they either have to fix that or maybe stop you can't all right well then stop drilling almost four whole periods of special teams and put it to something else because it's it's not paying off but they they are frustrated would that be fair to say Corey with what they're getting out of their special teams right now yeah and it's something that uh I'm gonna be we're, we're recording this on Monday evening afternoonish, but I'll be writing about it tonight is what I thought was interesting was the question is like Gene asked, I think, why don't you just take a, why don't you just fair catch it and start every drive at the 25? And it's the same thing I said to you last week. I didn't, I didn't know the numbers, but Papucha said on all the dry, all the kicks that they brought out. And there's been many of them. Their average starting field position is 20, the 23 yard line. So you're talking about the difference between two yards. Last Saturday was more egregious. It was more like eight yards, seven yards. But their whole process, like, I like what, that answer. Because if you, if you sell special teams as your calling card, I don't like what I'm seeing. How could anyone? But when your whole mindset is about special teams, when your opening pro- introductory press conference talks about the importance of special teams, and that's how you're going to judge this program, is by how good they are at special teams. And then... You don't return it well for three or four games. You just decide to concede. We're just going to fair catch everything. That's not the message they want to send. Well, it's more than and that's three or what four he said. games. They weren't they weren't returning kicks well last year either. That yeah, but was... it's it's not like the the difference between last year, this year, and then the Willie years was there aren't the blocks in the back that have you start at the seven because right. those are drive killers. That's a wrap. Yeah. You know, again, they think the re- the reward of bringing it out and maybe popping something, one out of every 30 returns, is better than just always starting at the 25. And I think some of that also has to do with their offense. Like, they, 
they don't trust their offense to be able to go 75 yards. Would you? So they're hoping right now it's hoping, hoping for like just a miracle that they can bust one. But I liked, I liked the fact that what he was, I liked what his message was. And I'm sure that comes from the head, uh, the top down was we're not going to concede that we can't do something and then just throw our hands up, like wave a white flag, like, well, we can't do this. So we're just going to always start at the 25. No, we're building this program on being good at special teams. And so we're going to keep working at it and we're going to keep trying it. And we're going to try it. We're not going to just be the coaching staff that just says, oh, well, we can't do it. Let's stop even worrying about it. This is this is like number one or 1A in what Norvell wants to be good at. Well, that's not true, but it's it's high up there. And so what message does it send to these guys that you've been preaching to for 18 months about how important it is to then just tell all these guys, you know, you've been telling them we're going to win games on special teams. We're due to bust one. You block it a certain way, we're out the gate. And then because you're not good at it right now, a third of the way through the season, that all of a sudden, or even if you want to go back to last year, you haven't been, you haven't shown an ability to be good at it yet. You just scrap it and say, never mind. It doesn't look like you believe in your message. So again, if they were starting the ball, if they were starting every time at the eight because of another block in the back, I'd be all for fair catching it because literally it seemed like two or three times a game with Alonzo Hampton, they were getting called for a block in the back and starting inside the 10. Well, now they're starting at the 23 as opposed to the 25. It's not good. It's awful. Um, especially Saturday, man. And, and what I asked, and this is something I brought up with you too. I asked them like, how do you know, like, and you're saying they don't have guys that can do it. Well, how do you know? Like, yeah, you're this like, is nothing. Yeah. You're, you asked them what you're like, how, how do you know when you can't hit a guy in practice? And he's like, that's a good question, Corey. Well, right. But my point being like, how do you know if a guy has a unique, uh, an innate ability to be a great kick returner when there's no contact and we've watched them work on the kick returns. Like we know Ja'Kai Douglas is fast. Notre Dame knows he's fast, um, but if it's, he's going to hit a hole, tackles, but breaking tackles, I mean that's not what made Tim it's Eric not Van breaking over tackles great. though. It's like it's like bouncing off him, right? Like kick return is different than punt return. Punt return is Peter Warwick. You stop and start. You make a guy miss. You hit a hole. Kick return is to, Mar- to Mark Vanover. You just hit it as hard as you can hit it, and if you're big enough and strong enough and fast enough, you hope they don't trip you up and they bounce off you. Like, think about Leon Washington returning kicks, man. He never slowed down. No, no. He bounced off guys. But he was just, it was just one cut and go. Yeah. Another cut and go. It's not the its not the Peter Warwick makes six guys miss. And that's what was so confusing and confounding about Ja'Kai's approach was like, what game do you think you're playing, man? What, what sport is this where you can tiptoe out and kind of shimmy, go sideways? You don't do that on a kick return. That Syracuse kid... He just busted it out of the end zone, going as fast as he possibly could. Yeah. And they they have not, at least Ja'Kai Douglas has not done that. But also, how would you know that Ja'Kai Douglas is going to run like that on a kick return when you never tackle him? You don't know how he how he handles that part of it when when he's when he knows he's never going to get hit. That's a weird... I don't know how they did it back in the day. Do you? Like, back in the 90s and 80s, was Tamaric Vanover, like, returning kicks against live... I'm sure he was, yeah. Special teams? Yeah. Because that's how you know how a guy's going to, if there's a crease, if he's going to tiptoe up to it, kind of dance too much, or if he's just going to hit it and assume you're going to bounce off him. Because that's how that's how Vanover and, and, and those guys return kicks. Full speed. LaMarcus Joyner, too. Uh, Greg Reed had a little more dancing in him, but he was, he was still more of a full speed guy. When he saw a hole, he hit it, and he ran as fast as he could. I don't know how you know if a guy can do that or not until he's in a game doing it. But we now know that 22 can't. So he doesn't ever need to do it again. He, he has a role on this team. He might end up being a, a, an important player down the road, but kick returner is not where his future is. So get somebody else out there that, uh, that, that can. I think Travis J is the guy they really like doing that, but he's been banged up and, and hasn't been able to play. So who knows? Willie Reed, too. We can't forget about Willie Reed when we're talking about great kick returners, punt returners. So, yeah, did he really, return kicks, though? I don't remember. That was the thing about Florida State, too. Like, Dion never returned kicks. Peter Warwick never returned kicks. T-Buck never returned kicks. Like, they were all just punt returner guys, and then the kick return guys were were different dudes uh, for, for whatever reason. I think because it's – I mean, I think Mickey Andrews, who coached special teams back then, thought of them as different skill sets. Yeah. Now, why you wouldn't have Dion return kicks, I, I would have done that at least once a game, but that's fine. Um but yeah, I think they're different skill sets. So they 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 went with different guys. And but yeah, um, I, I I wonder. 
I wonder how you evaluate in practice who gives you the best chance to hit a hole. Yeah, of course they're going to run fast when they know they're not going to get hit. They'll hit the hole 100 miles an hour. Look at me, coach. Look at me. I'm fearless. But in a game, man, Ja'Kai almost turned his back to the guys a couple of, the, back to the, the Syracuse a couple of times. So that's not the answer. Figure something else out. But I do like that their, their message isn't we're just going to give up and start fair catching it. I know you guys would love them to do that. It makes sense. But they're not built that way. They believe in what they're doing. They think they can win games by special teams. And they don't want to just send that message to these players, especially in a lost season anyway. Like if you're playing for a championship, sure. But it's a they want to build the foundation of we're going to be awesome at special teams. And you don't do that by waving a white flag and saying we, we're not good at this. We're going to even stop. We're going to stop practicing it. I just, you know, last thing I'll wrap up. I, I just think like as a, an opposing team, when, when Florida State can – a guy, a opposing team brings out the end zone, and Florida State tackles them before the twenty-five yard line. I feel like it gives you a lift. You're like, boom, suck it. You're stupid. You just lost three yards. And I know it's the difference between twenty-three and twenty-five is marginal, but I just think you're already setting yourself up for not failure, but you're not putting yourself in a position to succeed when you're not maximizing the amount of yards you can get. And then I think you give a lift to the other team, like when they tackle you at the twenty-yard line, when you're returning a kick from the two-yard line. Like, they're running off the field. They're getting clapped up. I was like, yeah, attaboy, way to go. And then half of those guys are turning around and running back on the field and then make you punt the ball. So, I don't know. I, 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 he did admit it, though, pretty much. Like, hey, we got to a point in there where if the ball gets in the end zone, we'll we'll, we'll take the 25-yard line. So, and that was your well, point, they, too. You're like, don't do it all the time. And, I'm, I'm yeah, if you return, like, on the four, yeah, go, man. I, I get it. Go. But, like, yeah, this team hasn't shown anybody, and I guess it goes counter to your point about you can't give up on this. I think you can at this point. No one on your team has shown the ability that they're going to – you start negative five in the end zone, no one's going to return it out past the 25. So why even do No, and they don't so? do that. But but there was a there was a play in that game where uh, – another kick in that game. I, I think – I don't even know how much is the distance as much as the height. Right. Like, if they kick a ball to the moon and it's coming down, I don't care if you catch it at the 13, man. Fair catch it. Like, if you're going to catch it standing still at the 13 and those guys are three yards from you, you're not going anywhere. So you have to know that. And there was a, there was a kick where the Syracuse kid, who had a pretty good leg, kicked it long and left, like maybe three yards deep and very high. And, man, it looked like Ja'Kai wanted to come out with it. He wanted to come out with it in the corner. Yeah. Like in the like coffin cornered, like two yards deep in the end zone in the corner, and I'm like they've got to know they've just got to be coached better than that to be like man you're not gonna that can't you can't come out right there and I I can't remember if he dropped it or if they yelled at him like if he if he you know begrudgingly took a knee but he really looked like he wanted to come out with it it's like I, I appreciate you want to go make a play man but you have to understand when you're in the when you're in the corner three yards in the end zone on a high kick. The probability of you even reaching the 20 is probably 15%. So just don't do it. Just know not to do it. And I'm glad they at least told him that. Like if it, But I don't think it should be dictated necessarily by, okay, if you're, what's the, if you're a yard in front of the goal line, come out with it. But if you're a yard into the end zone, no. What if it's a line drive that he catches three yards deep, but it's in the air for two seconds? And the that, coverage team is still at the 40. Like, that's that's what I would dictate when you come out with it, is how high the kick is and where you're catching it. Not just some blanket rule like, oh, if you're in the end zone, don't don't bring it out. Man, you can, they, that Syracuse kid, his last return to the 40, he was like four yards deep. He's like, you know what? I'm coming out. Good luck with this. I'm running full speed. You guys aren't used to seeing this. And he got out, he got out to the 40. Um, and, and that was another question I asked Papuchas. Is like, man, if you, I don't know if you can see it on TV, but when I was paying attention to their coverage unit, it I mean, it looked like, I mean, that kid was catching the ball in the end zone, and there was nobody even at the 30 yet. Like, they didn't even look like they were running hard, the the coverage unit. Um, and then, he, you know, he said that they, they had to make some adjustments because of injuries. They had another group out there. But, yeah, it was, it was ugly all around. Um, and I hope that Syracuse kid showed these coaches, and they should know they've been doing this for a long time. Norvell's had good special teams, so has Papucha's. That's what a kick returner looks like, man. Fearless, fast, doesn't slow down, hits a hole when he sees it, and knows there's going to be contact. And you're either going to you're going to tackle him or he's going to bounce off you. But he's running full speed to the nearest crease he can find and going north and south. That's how you return a kick. So, buddy, I have a feeling they're going to get a, the chance to practice it a few times Saturday in Chapel Hill. 
Maybe they bust one, my man, and then we're all singing the praises of old JP. I just love the amount of slack we just cut them on that. But when we talk about defensive backs having to hand guys off in traffic, it's like, well, they should be able to do that. That's not a problem. But, hey, judging how to return a kick, that's complicated. Anyhow, they'll be at practice, and we'll have live updates as well as interviews afterwards. Stay connected to WarChant.com. And at 1 p.m. live, seminal headlines right here on our YouTube channel as well as 93.3 FM in Tallahassee. For Corey, I'm Aslan. Thanks so much for listening to Wake Up WarChant, fueled by DeLuna Coffee. Come explore our world of coffee. DeLuna Coffee features over two dozen different blends. DeLuna's unique roasts can be delivered ground finely for drip coffee makers, coarse for the craft crowd, untouched as a whole bean, or even in convenient K-cups. Founded in 2014 by the Lemmix family, Ed and Brett are FSU alums and boosters who are extending a special offer to all listeners. Use the promo code WARCHANT15 for a 15% discount. Visit DeLunaCoffee.com and check out their Facebook and Instagram.